And that is kind of what the dark side of the moon looks like. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the recent announcement from China about the mission to the dark side of the moon. And we're also going to discuss other missions that are currently active on the moon and are, are planned by other countries. And all of this is, of course, because there is now a new kind of a renewal of interest in uh, various lunar missions. Various countries are planning missions in the next 10 years or so, and we're hopefully going to be actually creating some kind of a colony or a base or a permanent settlement right here on the surface of this beautiful object. So let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. So first of all, this is actually what the dark side, so-called dark side, looks like. It's not really dark though, it's only called the dark side because we don't really see it. However, it does get sunlight. Uh, a more appropriate term for it would be the invisible side. And that's because the uh, moon is tightly locked to our planet and it's always facing with the same sort of surface toward our planet. Now this uh, side is very different in comparison to the side that we're used to. And uh, the recent Chang'e 4 mission, I'm sure I mispronounced that, and my apologies for that, um, has actually uh, landed right um, on this side um, using a relatively complex uh, procedure. Now specifically, the reason it's complex is because it's impossible for a spacecraft to communicate with Earth that you can maybe see in the back right there from this particular location, because basically you're covered by the entire moon from uh, from the planet. And so for uh, us to communicate with Earth, we need to actually have some kind of an object in orbit around the moon to relay the messages. And this is exactly what China did. Back in May of 2018, they actually launched two uh, craft and uh, their names are, I'm also going to mispronounce that, I'm going to actually put this on the screen. Uh, these beautiful objects known as Kekiao. Kekiao? Kekiao. I don't really know how to pronounce it, but the idea here is pretty simple. You have two uh, satellites that relay messages between the lander, that's on the opposite, on the dark side of the moon, and the Earth. The relay satellite um, actually is located in the so-called Lagrange point, L2 point specifically, um, that is slightly farther away from, from the moon, and as it orbits here, it actually gets the view of Earth at all times. And uh, because of this, uh, China can actually communicate with the rover and with the actual um, probe as well without any interference and uh, with relative ease. Now, this is a really important achievement, uh, not just for China, but for uh, um, international astronomical community, because this kind of technology allows us to actually uh, establish communication relay networks across, well, the entire solar system now. This is a, an extremely important achievement and it's actually a demonstration of technology that hasn't really existed before. Even the Soviets or the uh, Americans were not actually able to create this just yet. Now the mission itself is relatively simple though. So you have the relay satellite, you have the ground station located uh, in China, and then you have the lander with a rover. And so this is actually a two-step mission. First you launch the relay satellite that stays in the L2 orbit, that's actually kind of unstable, so it does have to have corrections. And then you launch the actual rover that lands on the dark side. And though it does seem relatively simple in theory, in practice no one has actually been able to achieve it just yet. Now the landing spot itself was chosen um, kind of arbitrary actually. It's inside the Von Karman crater that's inside of a much larger SPA basin that um, is, well, actually a result of an extremely large collision, probably the largest ever. And one of the reasons this location was chosen was to actually study the um, lunar rocks, see if there's any difference between the dark side of the moon and the uh, side that we've studied already. And most importantly, it's actually meant to um, also study the possibility of using dark side of the moon as a kind of a radio telescope. And the theory of putting uh, radio telescopes on the dark side of the moon has actually been around for a long time, but we've never really done it until now. And so this is really a proof of concept because the Chinese lander that has just landed does have a very sort of primitive but functional radio telescope in it that will uh, be used for sort of a rudimentary um, attempt at radio astronomy. 
And the reason why uh, dark side of the moon is a perfect place for a radio telescope is because there is no interference from anything coming from Earth. And so for this reason, uh, scientists have actually been sort of planning this kind of a mission for a long time. On top of this, there's also uh, a panoramic camera to take photos of the space nearby. And uh, there is a spectrometer to measure the actual composition of rocks. There is a, um, a radar to probe the surface underneath the actual rover. There's also an instrument that will study the interaction of solar winds with the moon. And uh, there are even a few biological experiments, including the uh, silkworm larva and potato seeds that uh, will be used to study the survival rates of those organisms on the moon and their interaction with the lunar environment. So overall, this is actually a very uh, complex scientific mission and will hopefully bring quite a lot of scientific uh, discoveries in the next few years. But this is, of course, just the beginning of really exciting missions to the moon, as there are more missions planned uh, in 2019 and actually in the next decade. So here's actually a website uh, that you can find in the link in the description below by um, Ian Webster. He's actually a pretty famous creator of various um, astronomical simulations. And uh, he created this uh, moon simulation that has all of the missions, uh, I believe as of 2015 maybe, uh, from various countries. You can see the locations of various uh, probes that were landed. So for example, here's Lunar Orbiter 3. Here is Luna 9 from Russia and a few other probes here. And you can also see the uh, various orbiters that are still orbiting the moon. Uh, you can also sort this by countries. So for example, here is all of the American uh, missions and satellites. Here are all the Russians. Then we have uh, EU. There's only one that's showing. Uh, we also have China, and unfortunately this is um, Changi 1, I believe, or possibly Changi 2. Uh, the recent missions have not been added to this yet. We have one for Japan and then we have uh, one for India. But what this really shows you is how much we've already actually studied the moon and how many successful landings there were on the surface. You can actually see them as these yellow or orangey dots uh, scattered all over the place. But unfortunately, the recent missions haven't really been added even though there are currently four active missions here. So we have Changi 4 that just landed. We also have the previous Changi 3E, uh, which is also known as the Jade Rabbit or the U2 rover. Now, um, you may have actually heard about the landing, but uh, most people don't really know about what happened after because China did try to keep it sort of hush-hush. But in short, after a few minutes on the surface of the moon, uh, the U2 rover had a major failure of propulsion, and so it kind of just froze in space. But it's still functioning. After four years, it's literally just sitting there and, well, slowly collecting data, but not a very useful amount of data. Basically, its ultraviolet telescope is still fully functional and it is still sending in some data to the scientists, uh, but because it can't move and it can't really do anything else, for the most part, it's kind of useless. However, this of course helped China improve on the design and their most recent uh, landing, Chang'e uh, 4, was much more successful and uh, did not suffer from the same problems that the first rover did. And prior Chang'e 3 and 4, China had Chang'e 1 and 2. And these were actually uh, satellites that used to orbit the moon, but were later um, removed from there and changed orbits. And the reason why China decided to do this is because these were also um, communication satellites and China decided to test its relay communication network by sending these farther away from the moon and eventually actually putting them into an orbit really far away from the moon and essentially into a um, heliocentric orbit. And so by placing these orbiters into a heliocentric orbit, China has now established a relatively complex and relatively interesting communication network between satellites in lunar orbit, um, in Earth orbit, and also possibly in interplanetary orbit, including potential mission to Mars in the future. But not all missions uh, on the moon or around the moon are Chinese. There's actually uh, another mission called Artemis, whose main purpose is to study the various interactions of magnetosphere around our planet Earth uh, and compare them to what happens around the moon. So there's actually five satellites in total. Three of them orbit planet Earth. 
All five have relatively similar instruments, as a matter of fact, a uh, few of them have identical instruments, and their goal is to see the interaction of the magnetosphere with various areas around the planet, but, but to also see how the magnetosphere changes with various solar eruptions. So for the most part, this is actually a very complex mapping mission of the entire magnetosphere of our planet Earth. So for the most part, this is actually a very complex mission to try to map the entire magnetosphere of planet Earth and to also see how it interacts with the moon and how it changes depending on the solar activity. And the last active mission is this right here. This is LRO, also known as Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This particular mission um, is the reason we have such a detailed map of the moon. This is basically an extremely highly sensitive and very, very accurate camera that is used to take a high resolution images of the entire surface of the moon. And it's actually been here for a long time and has been actively taking photos and um, essentially mapping the surface of the moon for the past few decades. But it's actually about to get much more exciting because the fifth mission is going to launch on January 31st of 2018 and it's actually a mission by the um, Indian Space Agency called Chandrayaan-2. This is very similar to the Chinese mission where you have um, an orbiter, a lander and a rover but this is going to be a little bit more advanced because this particular mission is actually going to collect a sample and then return it back to Earth. Now, China is also planning a very similar mission, but later in the year, and it's going to be uh, known as Chang'e 5. And I believe Chang'e 6 is actually going to try to collect even more samples, but both of these missions are planned for, I think, the end of 2019. So India is actually going to be um, the third country ever to retrieve an actual uh, life sample from the moon. And that's just the beginning. We also have an independent startup known as Space IL that's going to launch its probe on top of SpaceX rocket uh, also in uh, January of 2019 or possibly a little bit later. It's not actually 100% certain yet. But this probe will also land on the moon and will actually use tiny rocket engines right here to try to navigate around the moon. So we have at least two more missions that are going to be added to uh, the already active four missions. And then we have China that's going to launch Chang'e 5 and Chang'e 6 that is also going to retrieve samples. So by the end of 2019, there's actually going to be possibly at least eight, maybe even more active missions. And not to mention that Roscosmos is also planning to go back to the moon. It's still kind of hazy on the details, but they're also planning to launch um, Luna 25 by the end of 2019 and it's going to be a, a polar lander. It's going to land somewhere in the polar region of the moon and also collect samples. Um, although not really return them, just study them on the surface. But the subsequent Luna 26, 27, 28 and 29 are actually going to return samples. All of these missions are planned for the next uh, five or so years. So we're not really sure on the details, but they're definitely in the planning. So what we know so far is that uh, there's definitely a new sort of uh, revigorated interest in the exploration and hopefully settlement of the moon. But whether this actually happens um, as a kind of a space race or as a kind of a joint uh, mission by several countries is another question. If this is another space race, it's probably going to end as soon as someone lands something there or establishes a base, just like it happened with the space race back in the 70s. Space race is not really what we want. We want to have a, a cooperation here. We want to have a cooperative mission similar to International Space Station, where several countries can actually collaborate and create something that's functional, something that's exciting and something that will actually create a new threshold for space exploration and for us as a human species. And so uh, what this actually suggests is that even though about five years ago, this is kind of what the surface of the moon looked like with only two active missions and the rest just being sort of the leftovers, the remainders from previous successes. In about five to 10 years, it's possible that this number will actually double. There's going to be a lot more active missions. There's maybe even going to be at least one attempt to launch a, an actual astronaut, possibly by actual startup like SpaceX. And it's very likely that um, we might even see the beginning of the first colony or at least some kind of a base in the next um, five to 10 years. If all goes well, Moon might not even be that unreachable frontier anymore. It might actually just become a relay point to 
in the exploration of the rest of the solar system. Now, when this happens is another question, but for now, all I can tell you is that 2019 is going to be an exciting year for lunar exploration, and it's definitely going to help us discover quite a lot of new things about this close neighbor of ours. This also means that 2019 serves as a kind of a year of renewal of the interest in the lunar exploration and um, will most likely begin a new era of really, really exciting research related to this unusual object. Now, as we discover these things, I'm going to cover them on this channel. So do subscribe if you still haven't and share this video with someone who enjoys watching space videos and wants to learn more about sciences and space. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Space out. And as always, bye-bye.